Well, today we are coming to chapter 19 of the story, and it is called The Return Home. So this, uh, we could subtitle this chapter, There's No Place Like Home, because the Jews are trying to get back to Jerusalem. Their destination is Jerusalem. And in this story today, we're going to hear about four people who are going to work together to help rebuild the temple and rebuild the people in Jerusalem. Now, these are not household names, so please uh, stay with me. Don't get lost this week as you go through the story. The first guy, his name is Zerubbabel. Zerub Zerubbabel, it's fun to say the name Zerubbabel. He leads the first group of exiles back to Jerusalem. Zerubbabel will lead the first group of people back to Jerusalem, and he will help rebuild the temple. But the temple wasn't, the project wasn't going as well as they had planned. So God sent two prophets to encourage them to keep working. Those two prophets would be named Haggai and Zechariah. So we have a lot of Z characters today. Zerubbabel, Zechariah, and Haggai. Haggai and Zechariah were two prophets who were challenged, helped challenge the people to rebuild the temple. The fourth character is where we are starting today in the book of Ezra. Now Ezra really doesn't come along until 80 years later, but he wrote the book, obviously, apparently, that tells us the story. And Ezra would help re rebuild the people in the Old Testament law. So remember those four people, Zerubbabel, Haggai, Zechariah, and Ezra. Names that might not be familiar to you, but hopefully they will be as we go through the story today. Chapter 19, we're going to start in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 and 3. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 and 3. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. Verse 3. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. Now, remember, Jerusalem is the place, as it was being destroyed, Jeremiah mourned and lamented over Jerusalem. In fact, he wrote the book of Lamentations about the fall and destruction of Jerusalem. Daniel, last week, we remember Daniel in Persia. And what would he do? He would open up his windows and pray toward Jerusalem. Jeremiah mourned over Jerusalem. Daniel prayed toward Jerusalem. And now Zerubbabel will bring the exiles back to Jerusalem. He will take them home. There's no place like home. Zerubbabel is going to lead the first group of exiles back to Jerusalem. And what's great about this is that we have seen in past chapters of the story, in past stories in God's Word, that the political powers were not always in favor of God's people. I mean, you can go all the way back to Pharaoh in Egypt. You can talk about last week with Daniel dealing with Nebuchadnezzar and uh, King Darius. But here, King Cyrus of Persia says, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. If you want to go back to Jerusalem, you are free to go. And when you go to Jerusalem, you can rebuild the temple to the Lord your God. It's interesting. He says, go build the temple, verse 3, the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus had some level of faith. It wasn't quite perfect faith. None of us have perfect faith, right? But, you know, he said, the God who is in Jerusalem. Well, God is not just in Jerusalem. He's everywhere. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But King Cyrus gave them permission to go. And back in verse 1, we are reminded that all of this fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. So God's word is being fulfilled. The prophecy of Jeremiah is being fulfilled in Ezra chapter 1. And the prophecy that we're talking about comes from Jeremiah chapter 29. Verses 10 and 11. One of these verses might sound very familiar to you. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God said you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. When 70 years are over, I will bring you back home. There's no place like home. I will bring you back home. I will bring you back to Jerusalem. And Zerubbabel was the one who led the way. And the last part of that passage is a verse that's very familiar to us, where God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. 
That was God's plan for the people of Jerusalem. It's still God's plan for you today. That God's plan for your life is the best plan to give you hope, to help you prosper. He's not going to harm you. He's going to do what is best for you. So let's find out how this progresses in Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to skip through the book of Ezra a little bit. We'll get into Haggai and Zechariah in a few moments, and then we'll come back to the book of Ezra in case, you're, you, know, in case you wanted to know where we're going. Merlin talked about a map. Well, stay close. We're going to go to Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah, and then back to Ezra. Ezra 3, verse 1. Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. John, this, it's, to me, this is the great, a great phrase where it says they assembled together as one. Sometimes uh, the Bible says they met together as one man. You know, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people would meet together as one man. And that's what's going on here in Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. They settled in their towns. The people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. They've settled back into their homes. Now they have a project to do. Now they have to rebuild the temple of God so people can have a place to worship. And we need to remember that as a church, we need to be united together. We need to work together. Unity is so important in a church. Disunity will kill a church very quickly. And I thought this was a great quote from John MacArthur. It's kind of a long quote. I want to share it with you. It's up on the screen. But just listen to this quote from John MacArthur. Mason, are you up there, buddy? Yes. There you go. John MacArthur. God's people are unified through obedience. The devil divides. He, div he works ceaselessly to separate what God has brought together. Marriages, churches, relationships where unity is essential. The exiles who returned to Jerusalem drew together, working together as one. When Christians unite in obedience, nothing can stand in their way. I thought that was great. I thought that was a great verse, or a great quote, excuse me, a great quote from John MacArthur. God unites, the devil divides. I remember I was working at a church where the youth minister was let go. The youth minister was dismissed from his position, and it started to divide the church. And I remember that I stood up in front of the church and I said, you know what, if you start to take sides, if you're going to side with the elders or if you're going to side with the youth minister, then the devil's already won. Because anytime he can divide a church or a relationship or a marriage, the devil has won. The Bible tells us as a church we should be perfectly united in mind and thought. And the Israelites came together in Jerusalem as one. They came together as one man. They were united and they were going to need to be united because any good project is going to have opposition. To rebuild the temple, there will be opposition. You might remember last year we went through the book of Nehemiah. He came to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. That story comes later. But he had opposition too. That's the way it goes. There will always be opposition. And we will find that in chapter 4, Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel... They came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you because like you we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Verse 3. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. When I think of these enemies of Zerubbabel and the enemies of Israel, I think if they only had a brain, right? You know, just like the Wizard of Oz, if they only had a brain. Now, the problem is that since the temple has been destroyed, the people have been worshiping however they want, whoever they want, doing whatever they want. And Zerubbabel's smart. He's like, we can't have that. That's what caused our destruction and our downfall in the first place. All of this idol worship and this worship of false religions, that's what caused all our problems in the past. And Zerubbabel is saying, we cannot let that infiltrate into the temple worship again. So he's trying to protect the temple and protect worship and most importantly, protect the people. Zerubbabel says, we're building it for the God of Israel. The God of Israel who's more powerful than any king of Israel, than any king of Babylon, than any king of Persia. God is greater than all of the kings of Persia. 
But what's cool is they had the authority of God. God wanted them to do this. But they also had the authority of King Cyrus, remember? King Cyrus was the one who gave them permission and commanded them and encouraged them to go back to Jerusalem. But what happens is these enemies persist. They start to spread discouragement. You can read this in chapter 4. They start to spread discouragement. They actually offer bribes to people to shut down the rebuilding of the temple. And they bring accusations to the king and say, you know what, these people are rebels. And if they, real, if they, real, if they rebuild this temple, there will be a mutiny, there will be a revolution. You need to shut it down right now. And if you look at the last verse of the chapter, verse 24, Ezra chapter 4, verse 24, it says, Thus the work of the, on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. They wanted to stop the rebuilding of the temple, and guess what happened? They succeeded. It happened. But fortunately, there's help on the way for Zerubbabel. Those two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. If you're turning in your Bibles, you can turn over to Haggai chapter 1. If you're following along in the story, you should find it on the next couple pages. But we're going to read some of the words of Haggai, who was sent there for one purpose, basically, to tell the people to rebuild the temple of God. Haggai chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Help is on the way from the prophet Haggai. Haggai chapter 1, verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Verse 7, This is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. It's interesting to me, I was thinking about this uh, this past week, that God was very upset. God was distressed. Because everybody in Jerusalem was busy rebuilding their own houses that they had neglected the house of God. They had neglected the temple. And uh, this week is, uh, has been an interesting week. You know, I would say that what our country and what the world is going through is unlike anything we've ever seen before. I told somebody this morning, I said, we know how to handle hurricanes. We don't know how to handle pandemics, right? You know, this is something we're not used to. And um, it's sad that in our community, in our culture, in the uh, United States, church has become less of a priority. Mr. Merlin Carr was talking about how <coughs> He can remember the day when people went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. There was a period of time that a, the average Christian would go to church twice a week. Now the average Christian, the average churchgoer, goes to church once a month. So it's changed a lot. So I think what was going on in Haggai is similar to what's going on in churches across our country today. Haggai says, you know what the problem is? Each of you is busy with your own house. Now, I don't know about you, but life is busy, right? I mean, it seems busier all the time. All this stuff that we've created to make life simpler seems like it's made us busier, right? So it's not a new problem. Haggai said it 2,500 years ago. He said, you people are so busy, you don't have time for God. Now, don't you love that Bible verse that says, be busy and know that I am God? Wait, did I get it wrong? How does it go? Be still. Be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46.10. Not be busy. I mean, if we really want to get to know God, it takes time for being still, not about being busy. And uh, the people in Haggai were more concerned about their comfort than their commitments. And we should ask ourselves, what's more important to us as individual Christians, as families, and as a church? Is it comfort or commitment? The house of God, the temple in Jerusalem, was in ruins. And God said it's time to rebuild it. Now, it's interesting because we do things every week to try to make our church look presentable, right? We have, pe we have people who clean the building. We have people who clean the restrooms. We have people who take care of the yard work. We just put a new carpet. And you might think, you know, 
why do we have to worry about carpet and the lawn and restrooms and things like that? Shouldn't people be spiritually mature enough to overlook those things? But you need to remember the people that we need to reach are not yet spiritually mature. And we, we want to do everything we can to draw people closer to God. Bob Russell says, if it bears God's name, it deserves our best. If it bears God's name, it deserves our best. Have you ever seen this happen in church where this is just a, a fictional situation? Let's pretend that there was supposed to be a women's trio singing today. There wasn't, but we're just pretending, right? Let's pretend there was a women's trio. It's time for the women's trio. Instead of three women coming to the front, it's only two. And the women get on the microphone and say, we need to apologize that because Bertha is sick, I thought somebody would laugh at Bertha, but that's okay. <laughs> now they do. Okay. Bertha is sick, and she's been sick all week, so we haven't had any time to practice this song. We're going to sing Give Up Your Best to the Master. Okay? Isn't that the way it goes sometimes? We don't put a lot of effort into it, yet we claim to be giving our best to the Master. And the Bible says we should always do all that we can for the work of God. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 says... Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Bible never says that you should do half, you know, go halfway or give less than 100%. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So when we clean the building, we want to clean it right. We want to do it with all our might. When we mow the yard, we want to do it with all our might. When we repaint, we want to do it with all our might. If it bears God's name, it deserves our best. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And that was a message that they needed to hear from Haggai. In fact, that's what he says in Haggai 2, verse 4. But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. I keep hearing that phrase all over, over and over again from God. I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. I brought you back to Jerusalem to rebuild your homes. Now it's time to rebuild the temple of God. He told Zerubbabel, be strong. You're leading the way. You're the leader of this project. You're the general contractor. He told Joshua the priest to be strong. You're a spiritual leader in Jerusalem. Now this is not Joshua who brought down the walls of Jericho. That was uh, many years before. This is a different Joshua. Same name, different guy. But then God told all the people, Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and do what? Work. 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 You know what? If, if our church is a body, right? The church is called the body of Christ. That means we all have a function in the body, right? If our church is a family, we sent out a text yesterday saying, CCDS family, we believe our church is a family, if our church is a family, every person has a responsibility. If our church is the army of God, then everybody has an assignment. Everybody has work to do. That's a biblical concept. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. The question is, how will they work? And the answer comes from one verse in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. And uh, it's a strong possibility that you've heard this verse before. This is God speaking to Zechariah. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And that's such a good verse. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. That was the message to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, you're not going to get the job done because you've got strong workers, because of your power, not because of your might. It will be accomplished because of my spirit. And I think that's where we struggle sometimes as a church because it's easy for us to go to get so caught up in the physical nature of who we are that we forget about the spiritual side of who we are. And God was telling Zerubbabel, this is not just a physical job of rebuilding the temple. It's about rebuilding the souls and the faith of the people. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. 
we need to ask ourselves, what does our church, the Christian Church of Deleon Springs, what do we need to thrive? What do we need in order to thrive? Some people would say, well, we need more bodies. We need more people. We need more higher attendance. There's some truth to that answer. Other people would say, we need more money, right? You know, things get done. If things are going to get done, we need more money. Other people would say, we need more buildings. You know, we need, you know, a nicer place to worship. You know, we need, a, a, you know, a, a, an actual church building. We need more buildings. We need more space. And uh, just step back and think about it for a moment. Those aren't bad answers, you know, to have more people, have more money. More money means we do more ministry, right? More buildings means we can, you know, offer more things to the community and to our church. But if all we need are buildings, bodies, and bucks, what about God? If all we need are buildings, bodies, and bucks, what about God? And that's what God was saying to Zechariah. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Um, Bob, could you come turn off the water in the baptistry, please? It's running over. Oh. Our cup running over. Be careful. <laughs> Clint's on the way. That's a plumber. The, yeah, those two knobs, the red and blue. Sorry about that, everybody. We're just overflowing with blessings today. Right? <laughs> Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. You guys okay? Yes, the drain is uh, back there, guys. It's right behind you, Bob. Under the wall, you got to reach up under there. Now, they're trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. No, that's wrong. I'm sorry. They're trying to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Zerubbabel's leading the way. Haggai and Zechariah are cheerleaders and encouragers and prophets coming alongside of them. But now we've got a new enemy on board. His name is Tatnai. Tatnai. I like to call him the tattletale. Tatnai, the tattletale. We're going to turn back to Ezra chapter 6. And uh, watch what goes on. In Ezra chapter 6, Tatnai comes along with a similar story. He says, you know what? The people of Jerusalem are rebels. And if they rebuild the temple, they'll start a revolution. They'll start a riot. There will be mutiny against the king of Persia. So he sent a letter to King Darius and said, you need to investigate and find out that the people of Jerusalem are troublemakers and you need to shut down this project. The only problem was, Tatnai was saying, you know what? They don't have the authority to do this. And we've already read that King Cyrus gave them permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So here's King Darius, the response of King Darius. Remember, Darius like Daniel. Here's the response of King Darius to Tatnai, the tattletale, in Ezra chapter 6, verse 6. Now then, Tatnai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bozani, and you other officials of that province, stay away from there. Do not interfere with the work on this temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I hereby decree what you are to do for these elders of the Jews in the construction of this house of God. Their expenses are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury from the revenues of Trans-Euphrates so, so that the work will not stop. Do you love that? Think about that for a minute. The... King Darius told Tatnai, stay away from there. You don't belong there. You don't have permission to be there. You will not hinder them. You will help them. You will not resist them. You will assist them. You will not stop them. You will supply them. Stay, weird, stay away and don't interfere. And did you notice what it says in that last part in verse 8? Here's what the king decreed. Their expenses are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury. Guess what, Tatnai? You're not allowed to stop it. In fact, now you're going to bankroll it. You're going to bankroll the building of the temple. Wouldn't it be great if the county came in and said, hey, Christian Church of DeLeon Springs, we just want to build you a brand new church building. Wouldn't that be awesome? I'd take it. You know, I'm a beggar. Sorry. Sorry to burst your bubble. But um, that's what happened. And you might think, man, things like this don't happen in our culture today. Things don't happen like this in our world anymore. But you might be surprised. I don't know if you, any of you have ever visited uh, Florida Christian College in Kissimmee. It's now called Johnson University. Uh, Mary and I met there. We graduated from there. And uh, 
Florida Christian College, uh, somewhere in the mid 80s, they were given 40 acres of property to create a college, to create a Christian college. They had already been in existence, but they were meeting in a church and they needed their own place. So somebody graciously donated 40 acres for the creation of a, a Christian college in Kissimmee, Florida. And they were celebrating, they were so excited. Then they realized that they would have to come into this 40 acres and in that area and put in all kinds of sewers and pipes and drains and things like that. And there was a problem. Money. How are we going to pay for all that? And a, a huge expense. And that's when they found out that the Houston Astros were moving in next door and they were going to put in all of the plumbing and all of the drains and all of the sewers and things like that. You know who paid the bill? The Houston Astros. And the college is still there and the Astros are not, okay? <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I'm just telling you. It can still happen today. So God, excuse me, King Darius told Tatnai, the tattletale, you'll leave them alone and you're going to pay for it. And in verse 14, we can see the end of the story. Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, a descendant of Edo. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the, and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. They finished the job. They had the permission of three kings, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. The temple was completed, and they celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. They praised God because now their temple was rebuilt. Twenty-two years later, the temple was finished. Zerubbabel brought them back. Haggai and Zechariah told them, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Your house is in good shape, but the house of God is in ruins. Finish the work, finish the job, and now the job was completed. And when I was reading that verse, they celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. You know what? In a few weeks, we are going to have the most joyous worship service that we have every year, right? Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is just a few weeks away, and uh, there are a lot of things going on in our country and in our community and in our culture right now. But our plan is to still have Easter services on Easter Sunday. In fact, uh, this is an invitation that will be available next Sunday. And what we're encouraging everybody to do, they'll be available next Sunday. It's, uh, on the front, it just says, you're invited. We're encouraging everybody to invite somebody to come to church. And remember, if you love our church, invite your friends. If you don't like our church, invite your enemies. Either way, somebody gets invited. But on the back side, it shows you, uh, it's kind of hard to read, I apologize. Uh, that's my fault. Um, on the back side, it, was, it says that we're having two services on Easter Sunday, like we always do. Uh, we're encouraging people to come as they are. They don't have to dress up. They don't have to look fancy. God accepts them as they are, and we will do the same. We're having an Easter egg hunt on April 5th. On Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, that will be Palm Sunday in the evening. And last year we had a good turnout. We, uh, we were threatened by rain last year. Hopefully we'll have better weather this year. But we're going to invite people to the egg hunt. So Palm Sunday, the egg hunt. Easter Sunday, worship services. The week after the uh, Easter egg hunt, it says on the invitation that we will have a free pancake breakfast. Now there's a, uh, what's it called? There's a caveat to that, okay? If we have a guest who joins us on Easter Sunday, they'll be able to go to the pancake breakfast, breakfast for free. But it's also going to be a fundraiser for our youth for their, summer, for their summer trips, for their summer activities. So we would ask church people to just make a donation at the pancake breakfast. If you want to do $10, $20, $5, whatever you can do, maybe more, whatever you want to do, you can do that. So hopefully, if they visit us for the egg hunt, they'll visit us for Easter Sunday. And if they visit us for Easter Sunday, they'll come for the pancake breakfast, right? We call that gut evangelism. We work through the belly, and hopefully we get people to come back. Oh, they will find out that our church is very loving and caring. Even when we don't uh, hug and shake hands, we're still very loving and caring. So please invite people to join us on Easter Sunday. Now, I know some of you might say, you know what, I'm afraid to do that. I'm afraid to invite somebody to church. 
Well, if you're afraid, to me you sound like the cowardly lion. Some people say, I can't invite people to church. I don't know enough. I don't have a brain. Don't say that, because then you sound like the scarecrow. Don't say, well, I just don't want to do it. Well, that sounds like a heart problem like the Tin Man. Don't make excuses. Invite people to join us for worship on Easter Sunday. Invite people with families and kids to join us for the Easter egg hunt. So those will be available next week, and we will have plenty of them. So we encourage everybody to pick several up and just invite people to join us for Easter. And uh, Lord willing, we'll have a great Easter Sunday. Hopefully all of this virus, uh, fear, and anxiety will be uh, a thing of the past. And we look forward to Easter Sunday coming up. I believe it's four weeks away. It'll be here before we know it. So uh, keep these services in prayer. Invite people to join us uh, for Easter worship. I just want to close with one passage of scripture. I'm thinking about how these exiles were realizing there's no place like home. They wanted to get back home to the place where they belong. Everybody needs a family. And as Christians, we all need to be part of God's family, the church. And uh, these verses in Galatians chapter 3 talk about that. In Galatians chapter 3, it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. You're part of God's family. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We're born into God's family. We're adopted into God's family. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's that theme of unity again. Because when someone believes in Jesus Christ, man, woman, or child, when they're baptized and clothed with Christ, we're all one. That's why we're here today. Because we love Jesus Christ. That who bring, that's who brings us together. That is our common bond. He's our common denominator. Jesus Christ. We're all one in Jesus Christ. So think about this question. Do you want to be an orphan? Or do you want to be part of God's family? Because when you realize that you want to be part of God's family, guess what? There's no place like home. 